Good. Um, thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I guess everyone will remark that it's a special pleasure to be doing this after, uh, after two years of not. Um, I didn't put in a, a specific slide to speak uh, to the, the generalities of more is different and, uh, and, or an homage to Phil. Um, I had the good fortune to be Phil's colleague for 20 years. Um, and uh, we didn't speak very often, but it was always memorable. He, he, uh, he mellowed with age. And um, uh, so there, there are a couple things I, I would point out that maybe some of you don't know. So one is that uh, this famous 1972 paper, More is Different, it is based on a lecture which he gave five years before that. So when you think about how visionary he was, you should remember that what you're reading is already five years after the, the lecture was given. Um, the other thing is, I, I should say that um, in my generation, if you were a young theoretical physicist and you were fascinated by the phenomena of life, then the one thing physicists and biologists agreed upon was that you were wasting your time. And um, Phil, as usual, dissented from the consensus. And uh, that was very important for me and for many others. So, um, Good. So the theme is the same as Jim's talk. The question is why simple models work. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try and talk mostly about very recent things uh, which are contained in these two preprints. Um, and uh, my version of what does it mean for a simple model to work, how do you describe the world, I take a very concrete version of the problem, relatively simple, very familiar to many of you. Imagine that you have n binary variables. So they could be spins, they could be neurons that are either on or off, uh, as they will be later on in the talk. Um, there's many questions. When you say, how, what does it mean to understand the system, you know, that's not very well posed. So let's be very specific. I want to write down the joint probability distribution of all the variables. So this is, what we off this is the starting point in statistical mechanics. But of course, when you come to a system that you don't understand, you don't have an underlying Hamiltonian, you don't know that there's a Boltzmann distribution, et cetera, et cetera, uh, just, writing, just getting to the starting point of statistical mechanics is already hard, right? And let me remind you of um, uh, a kind of obvious fact. Uh, Jean-Philippe warned us that the audience will be broad. I have, I'm, I'm looking out and seeing people I recognize, so maybe it's not as broad as you predicted, but OK. Uh, so it's all right to say a few obvious things. Um, uh, if I have n variables, n binary variables, describing the probability distribution means giving you a list of 2 to the n numbers. They add up to 1, but that's not a very strong constraint. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't help very much. It's important, but it doesn't help very much. Uh, and in principle, faced with a system with n binary variables, the probability distribution could be a list of 2 to the n numbers that have absolutely no structure to them, in principle. Um, and so the fact that we succeed in describing real, real world systems is the statement that that doesn't happen, that somehow that list of 2 to the n numbers has structure. And indeed, um, we're used to the idea that we can write down vastly simpler models. So when we write down an Ising model for these binary variables in which each one is, is influenced by an external field that biases you between the two binary choices, and the, and the binary variables interact with each other in pairs. Um, although uh, with proper uh, choices, um, this class of models could be paradigmatically complex, in fact, it's vastly simpler than it could be, because there's only n squared order n squared parameters here, not 2 to the n. Okay. So why does this work? So as Jim emphasized, um, there are a variety of reasons. Um, one is, it might be that you actually understand the microscopic interactions, and they are pairwise. And that's the end of the story. That's really all you need to write down. Okay? So if you want, this is in the debate between uh, a kind of reductionist view and, an, and a view of emergence. This is leaning on the side of reductionism. I went and I understood all the microscopic interactions. They really are pairwise, so there can only be n-squared terms in the model. Another possibility, um, which is also very familiar in physics, uh, 
is that interactions can be local. And then in that case, any one element only has a limited number of neighbors. And so if you count, then the number of parameters ends up being limited just because there aren't that many possibilities for interactions. The third one is, is the, the elegant one that, that comes out of the ideas of, you know, circa, <laughs> circa more is different, um, which is that although there might be many, many parameters at the microscopic scale, if you ask questions about macroscopic behaviors, um, then uh, things will simplify uh, through the normalization group. The, Technically, there'll be only a small number of relevant operators. Like the, um, the great discovery of the normalization group is that there are irrelevant operators. Um, and and there, are, there are variations on these ideas. And you, know, you just heard from Jim a, a, a different approach. And, and, but one thing I would point out of these, which are very familiar um, in the core of physics, if I go to a network of real neurons in the brain, um, one and two just don't work. So you might say, well, okay, there's no reason why micro interactions are microscopically pairwise. Um, you might think that interactions are still local. That's, that's in some sense true, but neurons are extended objects. And so that means that a single neuron can interact with thousands of other neurons, right? The distance between neurons is measured in microns, but the size of neurons is, can be millimeters and it's densely packed. So yes, it's local, you can't reach, there's no action at a distance, but over the distances where direct interactions are possible, think there are still many, many things you can interact with, and so locality doesn't help a lot. Um, for number three, um, maybe there are ways of using that to help simplify things about neurons, um, but I don't, I don't think we, I don't, it's not a program yet, right? Uh, people are experimenting, including us. So I want to draw attention to the fact that, that um, despite not having any good reason for why simplified models should work in the context of neurons, sometimes they work very well. And I also want to emphasize that, that you know, sometimes we say in the spirit of emergent phenomena and more is different and everything, one can capture the qualitative behavior at macroscopic scales with simplified models. But that's actually a bit unfair. Uh, in some cases, we can be quantitative. And so it's not just that you know, there are phases and you don't need to know every molecular detail in order to tell me what a solid is, and all the solids are in, all solids are in some senses the same. Um, in the examples that I'm thinking, I mean, in many examples in physics, and also in these examples in thinking about, um, if you want, the physics of neurons, um, one can do much better. So here's an example from work which is now a few years old. Um, well, um, where uh, my colleagues and I, and this was led by Lenoy Meshulam, um, looked at experiments that were being done in the hippocampus of the mouse. Uh, so the hippocampus is a region of the brain uh, which is quite well known because it's involved in our ability, well, it's involved in our ability to form short-term memories, form memories, but also uh, involved in our ability to navigate. So in this part of the brain, one finds these famous neurons that are active only when an animal is in a particular place in an environment. Um, and uh, what we did was to build those icing-like models. So the neurons will be described as being on or off. You can record in the, in the beginning. Uh, our experimentalist friends were recording from 100 neurons at a time. And uh, you can write down one of these Ising models, which, and the way we were thinking about it is that those are the maximum entropy models that are consistent with the measured pairwise correlations. So one way to think about constructing this model is, I have, a large, I have this large collection of binary variables, I measure the pairwise correlations among, well, the means, of course, but also the pairwise correlations among the binary variables. There's exactly one of those Ising models that will reproduce those, go find it, and now compute something else and see if you get it right. Well, you can test lots of things, but um, just to give an example, um, since you used the pairwise correlations, you should predict something higher order. So try predicting the triplet correlations. Well, with 100 neurons, there's 100, you know, there's 100 to the third power divided by 3 factorial, so 100, 100 some odd thousand examples of triplet correlations. And um, what you see is that 
Um, the observed and predicted things mostly overlap within error bars. And in fact, if you're careful about it, you can, you can ask, well, what is my prediction error? And what is my, um, so what, what, is, what are the errors of my predictions? And what are the errors in my measurements? And, how, and let me bin those according to the scale of the correlations themselves. And what you see in the middle panel is that the prediction, and, uh, the prediction errors and the measurement errors are essentially the same across the bulk of the dynamic range. Um, so the prediction error, it, it can't be smaller than the measurement error, otherwise you've overfit, right? Um, so you really can't do better than this. Um, and it's 100,000 different uh, things that you have to get right. It's not, it, I mean, we were kind of surprised. Um, it was sort of charming, you know, this, because this is a system in, that the biologists have studied a lot, they have models, right, where you say, well, the important thing is this business about place. So suppose we make a model in which neurons are active depending on where the animal is during the experiment, and that's all. And otherwise, they're independent of each other. So you don't take a sort of statistical physics view, you take this kind of uh, um, uh, view of neurons as representing the outside world. Um, and if you try predicting the um, triplet correlations, you fail qualitatively. Actually, if you try predicting the pairwise correlations, you also fail qualitatively. Um, but since we use the pairwise correlations, that's not clear that that means anything. Um, this is one of those examples where when people tell you that they understand what's going on, um, you need to ask them what they calculated. So qualitatively, it's true. This neuron fires when the animal's over here. This neuron fires when the animal's over here. But actually, use that to calculate something, and it doesn't work. On the other hand, these very simple models succeed. On the other hand, um, we had actually started by trying to do what we thought was a simpler problem, which was to think about the activity of neurons in the retina as the retina responds to naturalistic stimuli. And that's, that's where we started this effort of building maximum entry models. And without going into details, um, the black is, uh, is the simple pairwise model, again, for 100 neurons. Um, the red is an imp improved model, which actually we can discuss how improved it is. Um, we were happy at the time, but in retrospect, I'm not so sure. Um, the important thing is at the bottom, where again, we're, we're looking at our, our errors in predicting triplet correlations. And what you'll notice is that uh, it is true that the improved model, the red one, is below the black one. Uh, now we're, we're looking at the function of the number of, we, number of neurons that we keep track of in the population. Uh, but it's the dashed line at the bottom, which is the typical level of experimental error. And so you see that we're really doing very badly in some sense. I mean, the correlations aren't very big. So at first you think, oh, that's pretty good. Uh, but eh, not really. Bill, can, I, can I just ask something? If you could comment on the different uses of the term model. So there's a model as in some causative model, and there's a model which is a sort of fit. So if you're using it is it back and forth. Yeah, so, right. So yeah, which one is? So the, que the question was about the use of the word model. And um, uh, words like causality and fitting, which are all provocative words, came up. Um, as, as, uh, but um, so let me be precise. What I mean is I wrote down the probability distribution, the joint probability distribution for all the variables. That's the model. Now, do you want to attach causal significance to any of the things that are inside it? That's your choice. And I, I would caution against that myself. but. Um, uh, but okay, so that's that's what I mean. Okay, so so we have examples where things work quite well, but not perfectly, and then we have other examples where they work, you know, so as well as you can imagine. Um, please. Um, we might by the end of the talk. We can discuss. And that is to say, I will, I will give you something that works better by the end of the talk and understand as it goes with causal and fit and you know, one of those complicated words. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, we started trying to think a little more, a, a little more I don't know, specifically, generally, about the, the problem of, of simplification. And what I want to draw your attention to is um, this idea. Okay, well, um, I have a big system with n degrees of freedom. 
I can divide that into a small system with k degrees of freedom and a surrounding with n minus k degrees of freedom. Now, if I'm going to build an effective model of the system as a whole, I mean, one, way, one approximation I can make is to say the things inside the little box are independent of the things outside. But then in that case, it's not really an interacting system, right? It's not very interesting. It's a little anemic, but OK. Um, I don't know if it's that much better than gesturing. But anyhow, uh, so if you imagine that, that this part of the system was totally independent of everything else, of course, and you could do that over and over again, then of course you could write down an extremely simple model. But it also wouldn't be very interesting. The reason that there's something interesting going on is that there's information shared between the degrees of freedom inside the little box and the rest of the, and the, rest of the, the, rest of the system. And uh, one way to think about it is that your effectiveness in building a model, or your effectiveness in writing down the probability, the joint probability description for all the variables, is determined by your, the ability of your description to capture the information that's shared between these degrees of freedom and these degrees of freedom. So technically, the mutual information between these variables and those variables. So if I, if I were trying to be more precise, um, I would say that if I give you a model of the probability distribution, if I give you a description of the probability distribution for a system, you know that you can use that probability distribution to build an algorithm for compressing data, or compressing uh, the states of the system. And um, the, the, the best compression you could do is if you had the, the correct probability distribution, you could compress down to the entropy of that distribution. If you have an incorrect distribution, then you will miss, and your description will be longer. Right? You'll need a longer code. Um, and uh, if, you f if your model fails to capture the, the mutual information, then every bit of shared information that you miss is an extra bit that you need for the code length. Um, and so again, since I was cautioned about the breadth of the audience, let me apologize to people who would like this stated more precisely. But I, I think the audience will divide into the people for whom writing down an equation will not help and the people who can imagine the equation from the words. So uh, <laughs> um, let, let me not, let me keep going. And it's important, right? The, the, the problem is that if, um, if this mutual information is extensive in the size of the system, then it's going to be very hard to make any progress, right? Because if I really need lots of bits, in order to, so to describe the influence of the outside world on this system, if I need lots and lots of bits, then uh, two to that number of bits is the number of parameters that I need in my description of the probability distribution. And this is somehow connected to things that our friends in quantum information think about, um, but that's maybe for another time. So um, the intuition is that in order to tell you everything about what the outside world, how, about how the outside world influences the things going on inside this little box, I don't need to tell you every single detail. And that's why simplification is going to be possible. So what does that mean? It means, technically, that I can take these n minus k degrees of freedom and compress them into a shorter description, a description which has not two to the, two to the to the n states, but some, some much smaller number of states. And that nonetheless, um, the information that that compressed description gives about the, the variables inside the box will be close to the maximum. And so there's a trade-off, right? Um, you can think about doing different kinds of compression and keeping more or less information about what's going on in the outside world. And then correspondingly, you'll capture more or less information about what's going on inside the little box. You can't do better than all the information that's, that's present. Um, for any point on the x-axis, that is to say, if I tell you, I give you 37 bits to describe what's going on in the outside world, there is a best you can do. And you can find this by a variety of algorithms. This is a problem that um, Tali Tishby and Fernando Pereira and I worked on a long time ago. Um, it's just kind of taken on a life of its own, um, not, not any result of anything I did, um, but uh, which came to be called the information bottleneck. Um, and what you're doing, right, if in, at, this wasn't the way we were thinking about it at the time, 
But what you're doing here is you're approximating the conditional distribution of what happens inside the little box on the rest of the system by saying that it depends only on this, this compressed variable. And of course, then the number of parameters that you need to describe this goes like the, the number of states of this, um, of this variable x. And I should say that you can work this, you can work this out, including, so, sorry, the important thing to know about this plane where you trade uh, bits of information about the outside world versus bits of information uh, about what's happening inside the little box is that there is a bounding curve, right? So there's a limit to how well you can do. Um, you can work out this structure. Um, you, you can approximate it by taking uh, x's of different cardinality and, uh, and, and sort of doing the best you can with x's of different cardinality. In the limit, you could imagine using uh, infinite cardinality, but keeping only a limited number of bits because your mapping becomes noisy. But that's a little bit complicated, so it's maybe easier to think about the case where the mapping is, uh, from uh, this mapping is deterministic, and then as you change the cardinality of x, you do better and better. These are these endpoints. Um, technically, the question of whether you can build, find a simple model or not is the behavior of, of epsilon in relation to the cardinality of x in the limit that n goes to infinity. So one can build up a certain amount of theoretical structure. Um, one can use this to work out how this, how this goes in familiar physics models. Let me make an obvious remark, or a simple remark. Um, one shouldn't say obvious. You know, after, after I said, this is a joke, right? The guy, I'm sorry, I don't understand. He's thinking about it for a while. So, no, I was right, it was obvious. Um, so uh, if you take familiar models in statistical physics, and you grind through all of this, you realize that, that it works that in the sense that you can achieve very small epsilon, or even epsilon can go to zero at finite values of the cardinality of x. And the simplest example of that is if you only have local interactions. Because then it doesn't matter how big the system is. In order to know the influence of the system on what's going on inside the little box, all you need to know about is what happens at the boundary. And, and so that's, and there's some limited number of states taken on by the variables that live at the boundary, and that's it. That's the cardinality of x that you need to keep. Um, and so on. And it's fun to work this out for different problems um, and to try and classify, you know, what are the possible beha behaviors of epsilon versus the cardinality of x. It's all very interesting, um, but uh, what matters is whether this works for the data in the real world. Um, let me also point out that, in some sense, you know, we, we, I started by noting that, that uh, there's this potential disaster, right, which is that if I try to describe a system with n binary variables, the, the joint probability distribution is just a list of two to the n numbers. If I choose that distribution, if I actually choose that distribution at random, it's called the random energy model, then this doesn't work, right? That is to say, you, you can't do the compression. So in some sense, the typical probability distribution is not, does not have this compressibility property. Okay. So it would be a property of the, real, of the real world that would be helping us, helping us make, uh, make mathematics more, more effective, right? It would be something about the world that this compressibility exists. It's not typical. By the way, to make the connection to, to um, entanglement in, in quantum information, Right? There's, a, there's a similar thing, that in some way, if I write down an arbitrary wave function with n degrees of freedom, it's typically very highly entangled and doesn't obey an area law. Right? But you know, real-world ground states of quantum, uh, quantum states of the ground states of quantum systems that you find in the real world do obey those laws. Right? So there's something special about them. So same thing, same thing here. So let's try. So let's go back to that example in the retina. And I want, to emphasize, I want to tell you exactly what we did um, uh, to emphasize a couple of points. So box, you know, small box, big box, what size should you choose? I want to do an analysis of real data. I need to be careful, right? So we made the box, the little box, as small as we could. It's one neuron. And then we made the, the outside box as big as we could but being sure that we had enough data from our experimentalist friends that we could completely sample everything so we don't have to answer all those annoying questions. 
Okay? That unfortunately puts us at, at eight, which is not exactly gigantic. But hold that thought. We'll do better. Still, with eight neurons, in principle, there are 256 states, of which 90% are actually seen in the experiment. So um, you really would need something like 256 parameters to describe, or 250 some odd parameters, to describe um, the influence of these eight neurons on one neuron. But what you see is that we can compress into 10, 15 states and capture all of the information within error bars. And again, we chose eight neurons. The error bars are small. So that's good news, right? And you can do this. I mean, you could choose your neuron in the middle, the, the, the one neuron. You can choose from, I don't know, 160 in the experiment. And you can choose different groups of eight. It's most interesting to choose the ones that have a large mutual information with the, with the neuron that you're looking at. And it always works. But importantly, you can iterate. So what we've been doing is we have one neuron that, of course, has two states. And there are eight neurons that have 256 states. And we compressed those into 15 states. And we chose, for example, the eight neurons that share the most mutual information with the first neuron. But then there's the next eight neurons. And you could do the same exercise. And the next eight neurons, and you do the same exercise. And, so and you think, huh, 15 states, 15 states. That's, uh, together, that's almost 256 states, right? So it's kind of like where we were before. So let's do it again. And then it turns out that, well, in order to be sure that you capture all the information, you need about 25 states. And you think, let's do it again. And so what you see here is the fraction. So remember, every time you do this, you could have picked a different neuron right, as, as your central focus. And so there's many choices, and you can always, uh, and you can, it, things don't work perfectly each time. Um, and so to, you know, the statement that you can get away with 15 states is some sort of uh, typical statement. Um, and so what we did was we said, well, let's be sure that it always works 90% of the time. Um, and, but 90, it's 90 percent of the time you capture all the information within error bars, and so you need a little, you need a few more states at the second one and a few more states at the third one. Um, but what you notice is that the number of states is actually growing linearly with the number of neurons, right? um, and not exponentially in the number of neurons. So you've actually tamed the combinatorial explosion. Right? I've shown you that you can capture the information that's shared between one neuron and n neurons with models whose number of parameters is scaling like n, not like 2 to the n. Okay. Now, um, this is exactly what happens, by the way, if you have pairwise interactions. Right? One, one thing uh, with pairs, right? you have one thing, and it can interact with n other things, and so you need a weight for each of them. Except I told you that in this system, the pairwise thing doesn't work. So you've recovered a description which is of the same complexity as the pairwise description, but it's not that. And, and it's kind of complicated and messy. And to be honest, we don't understand exactly what it is telling us. But it's even simpler than pairwise, right? Because you have n interacting instead of n squared. Ah, but this is for one neuron interacting with n others, right? So there's another factor of n. Yeah, no, it, OK. <laughs> By the way, I mean, as an aside, as n gets larger, my interest in getting n instead of n squared goes up substantially, right? Uh, but for the moment, the fact that we can do n squared. OK, so let, let me just stop here, leave some time for discussion. So the, what I hope I've illustrated for you is that you can make simpler models by taking data compression seriously as a tool. That, that the essential thing you're doing when you're describing uh, the probability distribution for interacting degrees of freedom is you're trying to capture shared information among those degrees of freedom. And so we know, I mean, we know that information could be compressed. And in some way, that is a tool toward building simpler, simpler models. And we have you know, some theoretical results, which you know, it's not terribly sophisticated, but uh, um, I didn't think it was really the essence of what I want to say here. We were surprised that in taking this idea, which um, we were sort of excited about and, and uh, uh, 
sort of intrigued by, um, we just decided, well, why don't we just try it? And it actually works. Um, and, and as I already mentioned, it works in a way which is what you would expect if there were pairwise interactions as in the Ising model, but we know that that's not the answer. It's, find, it's finding something else. So that's good news because it says that it can find a simplified description uh, that we didn't know to write down in the beginning. Whether, as with other problems, this is a, an interpretable description or not, that's another story. And what I'd like to leave you with is the idea that, that maybe this notion of compressibility is, uh, has some uh, deeper status in our understanding of why simple models work and describe the world. That the, the interactions among large numbers of degrees of freedom, the, our ability to describe them hinges on our ability to compress the information that's shared among all those degrees of freedom. And maybe taking, in, in certain contexts, that's a sort of trivial statement, but maybe as we move away from those contexts towards systems that, that we find more interesting and challenging today, taking that statement very seriously is a path to constructing models that we might not have thought to write down. So, thanks. Thank you.